Hello, everyone. My name is Alex Malesevich, and I'm the Clinical Sales Manager with CRED. Welcome to our Clinical Education webcast. Today, we are excited to further expand our SGRT Education Series by welcoming Sebastian Wojcikowski and Adam Selby. Sebastian has been a qualified radiation therapist and dosimetrist for more than a decade and is working currently at the Clinic Favoriten in Vienna. Adam Selby is a Deputy Head of Treatment Planning at the Southwest Wales Cancer Centre in Swansea. He leads a dynamic team who are dedicated to advancing cancer treatment technologies and practices. Over the past years, Sebastian and Adam have led the commissioning and clinical implementation of CRAT systems at their respective departments. They are experienced users of CRAT technology and for many years adopted tattooless patient positioning workflows and advanced treatment routines. Together, they will share experiences obtained on both Electa and Varian Linux and provide practical advice to elevate your own clinical routines with the help of surface scanning technology. Before I hand over to Sebastian to begin today's session, I would like to cover some quick information about today's webinar. This session is being recorded. You will receive a link to the presentation via email, and it will also be made available on the CRAT website if you would like to review it at a later time or share it with a colleague who was unable to join us today. If you have any questions during the presentation, please go ahead and enter them at any time in the chat function. I will moderate those questions at the end of the presentation. The presentation is approximately 40 minutes long with Q&A at the end. If you have trouble hearing, adjust your volume. If that doesn't help, try signing out and back in again. Thank you for your attention. Now I'll hand it over to Sebastian. Um, so welcome all to my presentation and uh, thank you, Alex, for the great description of me and what I'm doing. I will also thank uh, CRED for the possibility to show what we are doing in our clinic. And now I want to start my presentation. So in my presentation, I give you an overview of the relevant clinical applications of Catalyst Surface Guidance. The content will be split into three phases. So in the first phase, I will tell you something about the overview, about the basic system functionality, about the surface scanning principles, technical configuration. In the second part, I will go through the workflow, what is changing for the staff, what we are doing, and uh, which patients we here in the clinic have written are positioning the patients. And in the third part, uh, we are going through our experience with the system and a little comparison, uh, what I have done 2017 without Catalyst and with Catalyst. So a little bit about my person. I'm born in Vienna, 1990. My parents are originally from Poland. That's why the complicated name. And I graduated the RT studies at EFA Campus Vienna in 2013. And I'm straight after the studies, I started working at the Clinic Favoriten. And first I started as an RTT uh, on Varian Trubin. After some years of practice, I'm now dosimetrist and working with the planning stuff. So I'm doing the CT scans, but I'm also planning here in our clinic. Um, a little bit up about our hospital. So our hospital was established in 1887 and uh, as the fourth hospital in, in Vienna. It was originally an epidemic hospital because there was some smallpox diseases outbreaks in Vienna and they hadn't enough beds in the other hospitals. So they had to build a new hospital. And currently we have uh, 646 beds in our hospital and there is a working around 2500 employees our department of radio oncology is really small we have two variant rubim accelerators and one toshiba now canon city and we are doing around 1400 patients a year maybe 1500 and last year we have done 1410 patients so now i'm starting with 
the overview uh, of the system. So it is a 3D surface scanner. Positioning without radiation and skin tags are not needed with the Catalyst system. That are the three basics that are very important and very beneficial. How is the system working? So in our clinic, we have mounted uh, the HD system and it has three cameras and every camera has a projector, a digital light processing unit and a camera. And the digital light processing, the DLP beamer, is beaming the light on the patient and the camera is catching this light uh, with a sensor so it catches back the light. And here you can then see the structure of the patient. Like I said, there are two versions. One is the HD and one is with one camera. We have the HD Catalyst version because you, you see the patient way better with three cameras from every side, but it's also possible with one camera. How does this look on the patient? So um, it looks like checkerboard pattern on the patient uh, because the system is projecting lines on the on the patient. And when you this lines very high speed for the naked eye, it looks then like a checkerboard. And because we know our bodies are not um, perfectly straight, for that reason, this checkerboard pattern is like bent a little bit and the lines appear as a curve and the camera then catches this light and as a curve. Here you have a picture of our of our variant Rubim accelerator and on the ceiling you can see our cameras. There are two cameras you can see and the third one is in behind the variant Rubim. So in our room we have three cameras and one monitor where you can see the patient and everything. There is one computer outside as a server, but this one computer is like for both machines. And then we have an interface between Varian and Sirat, so we can send the corrections that this Sirat is showing to the table of Varian. Uh, how is the workflow? So it starts, you are planning normally your patient and everything, contouring and, and so on. And when you are ready with this plan, you export the data from the treatment plan. In our, at our department, we are sending it from ARIA, from the variant system. And then we have to import the data into the catalyst system. And then we have to edit like templates and bounding box and 3D settings and adjust the uh, exposure settings too. This you can see here on this page. So at first you are selecting which template you're using. So we have here like a lot of different uh, templates for a lot of different entities because you have different like ranges at some points for head and neck patient who is not tolerating a mask. You have to have like really strict movement boundaries. So when he moves a little bit, the machine is not radiating. The bounding box you have to adjust to every patient because not every patient is like a standard uh, size and editing the imported image so at some patients you can cut off some body structures that you don't need to for the radiation we are cutting sometimes the head from the best patients when it's when there is no uh, superclavicular field so for that reason we have here some different settings here you see why you should always do adjustment of the uh, sensitivity of the camera. In this case, it wasn't too good, but when you adjust it good, the picture should look like this at the, at the end. So you can really see the arms good for positioning the arms with the breast cancer patient. That is one very important step because not every patient has the same skin color. And for that reason, you have to adjust it. And there you have like settings high, low, and this the settings for high and low, you can also adjust. So there is a lot of possibilities. Now to the workflow, what will change for my stuff? I, I can remember when we started with the Catalyst system, the staff was very unsure how it, my colleagues and even I was very, very, very unsure how we have to use it uh, at which point. But we are, for that reason that the radiation is like so old already and, and long, and you have always used like tattoos or skin markers, everyone is very skeptic when you don't need this anymore. 
and for uh, that reason that is a big change when you don't have to mark a lot of things on the skin like field entry or maybe some other stuff uh, what is really nice is that you have a surveillance during the irradiation so it's an additional uh, protection for the patient when he's moving or something the irradiation stops and we are saving time with every patient when you get used to the system it takes time like every new things but when you get used to it you you are really saving time for for the patient and it's a lot of help with non-standard positions so when you don't have like normal positions where you can put the arms up or or the legs somewhere or the patients are not in a really good shape it helps a lot to to position this kind of patients where we are using the the catalyst system the most so the most we are using it for the breast cancer patients for the lung cancer patients axillary irradiation too very similar to breast cancer uh, head and neck cancer patients but here we are using it for positioning the shoulders right and for the extremities why at the head and neck cancer patients for the shoulders because when we have the mask on the on the patients the body structure from our planning uh, system is the head the skin but we have the mask on the patient so it's not the same where we are not using it is for prostate patients and rectal patients for the pelvis we don't use it for the central nerve system where like glioblastoma or something there when they have a mask because you see it here in the picture it's it's showing the mask but the body structure is like you see the lips and the nose and we don't use it for radiation with electrons because there is the tubus in the picture and that wouldn't go too well here you have you can see a good comparison of one patient the arm position is so important that the breast cancer patients you can see it here at the at this side that there is not a lot of, of breast tissue and when you put the arm more up you can see that it's coming here and that is ideal when it's like a little bit blue and a little bit green the green one is the body structure from the planning system and the blue one is the life image so when you see the projections of yellow light at your patient you will see it on the monitor what is inside the room and on the patient too uh, then you have to drag the arm to the face a little bit nearer when you see red then it's outside of the body so you know it that it's too low the, the arm is too low at the next page you see one patient which is uh, irradiated without a mask in the head and neck area here you see the shoulders one is a little bit higher one is a little bit lower for that reason you can see maybe he's rotated or the shoulders are a little bit different that you can see with the system very good because sometimes you can do like really big body structures and then you see the whole patient very well yeah in this case we have a patient where we irradiate the the shoulder and the arm a little bit so you have a really good body structure how to lay the patient what are the biggest advantages for us so at the beginning when we got catalyst there was no like interface between catalyst and, and varian and we had to <laughs> do the table positions to calculate them with our with our brains now we can send them automatically this is great because do a little bit of movement with the patient or something you can send it automatically to the variant system and then on the pendant in the in the radiation room you just move the table what is great you position the patient without ionizing radiation that is great the skin markings you don't need for sure you can have some to help but you wouldn't need them it's a little bit faster the positioning for sure because you can lay down the patient and when you see his position good then you can start the catalyst from the beginning and have, don't have to look at the lasers and when you know skin is like movable very easy you can irradiate uh, without fixations so at some extremities you don't have to do a mask because you you can control them when the irradiation happens and it's a backup check for setup errors too so when at the ct is not writing down the right positioning or uh, or something and then you see oh in the catalyst mm, maybe that the arm should be a little bit higher or lower that's a good uh, system to control these parts here you see a video of patients who were laid down that was right at the beginning when we got catalyst they were laid down with the skin markings with the laser and and then this is the first picture what we took so you see how 
big differences are in between one day and another day in rotations and and the arm positions and everything. You can't mark how the arms are laying and you can't mark them with skin markings or with tattoos that you will never do. And for that reason, that is a really big advantage with a surface scan, 3D surface scanner to catch those arms or or you see the head sometimes is, is like not uh, positioned right. That's too a really big advantage in this case. So after we got the system uh, in 2014, we got the system. I have took 15 patients before we got the system and 15 patients from 2016 all got the start B protocol with 15 radiations. And I have done each routine session. We are doing all this treatment part before we radiate the patients. Uh, so it's from the second to the 15th fraction only because at the first fraction, we are always doing KV, KV. So, and in total, uh, I've matched like 1,400 uh, portal images. We are always adapting to the chest wall because of our planning. And I compared the online and the offline corrections with the translation and the rotation. So pitch, roll, rotation, and the trans all the translation, all the free translations. So you have on the left side, you have the from the planning CT, the DRR, and on the right side, you have the treatment port. And then we match them together. Uh, on the ribs, on the chest wall, and here you have then the, the translations and everything. And when I was comparing the translations, for me, it was important that I match them all offline as one person and online that I have done my RGT colleagues. On the left side, you see in centimeters how much we have the vector, how much is the delineation, how much the picture is uh, got shifted, and on the on the down part you have the fractions from two to fifteen. And you see on the left side you have the data from 2013 with the average values at every fraction, and on the right side you have it from 2016. And you see we had shifted the treatment port around 0 free, so three millimeters uh, in the online, and I have shifted them then on the offline part 0 0.5 millimeters. And the consistency uh, of every average from every fraction is very different. And when you see them on the right side it changes dramatically. So my own offline shifts were zero three centimeters, so three millimeters, and the online shift from my colleagues was one millimeter. So you see a big difference and, and for which uh, PTV uh, you will use for your patients, you could lower the PTV margins when you have a system like this. That is what was important to me to show that there is like a really big change when you get a sy system like this for your breast patients. So that would be my little introduction. I will want to thank um, everyone at my staff here in, in the clinic favoriten that they gave me the time to, to make this presentation because it's like very tough next to doing the routine and especially my planning staff, they are getting me a lot of time and yeah, when somebody wants a contact or something, I have I have my contact here for email. I'm open to all questions. And thank you, Alex, for this opportunity to talk. And thank you, Sirat. And now I will give to my colleague, Adam, who will now take his presentation. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Sebastian, for that talk. And thank you, Sirad, for the opportunity to be able to present today. Um, like Alex said, uh, my name's Adam. I'm a clinical scientist at the Southwest Wales Cancer Centre in Swansea. And today I'm going to focus on how we've been able to implement CRAD SGLT systems, especially for deep inspiration breath hold patients at Swansea. So I'll start off by sharing with you a bit about the Southwest Wales Cancer Centre in Swansea and some of the systems that we have installed. I'll then focus more on the Sentinel uh, CRAD system and share with you some of the clinical applications that we're using the system for. I'll then kind of drill into the details of how we specifically scan and treat deep inspiration breath hold patients. And then within the presentation, I'll touch upon some of the considerations that we've had to make for uh, scanning and treating patients without tattoos and also with bolus. So to start with, hopefully on the map there, you can see the pin of Swansea just in the South Wales. Um, we provide a cancer service for a population of about 900,000 people, and we treat on average about 2,200 patients a year. 
were in all Electa Center. Uh, so we've got four Versa HD Linux, and on all of those systems, we've got a Catalyst Plus HD systems. On two of our systems, we've got the visual light coaching panels. And then when it comes to CTs, we've got two Philips CT scanners. And on our newer CT scanner that was installed in 2019, we have the Sentinel system. And finally, we're transitioning at the moment from Pinnacle to Monaco as our treatment planning system. So many of you will know this already, but SGLT, it's short for Surface Guided Radiotherapy. Um, and there's different applications of SGLT on both the CT scanner and on treatment. So to start with, I'm going to focus more on some of the CT applications that we use in Swansea. So if you're a patient lying on the bed and you're looking up, this is what you'll see. You'll see a laser at the top of this Sentinel pod and at the bottom, there's a camera. So the Sentinel system actually includes a 690 nanometer laser, and then you've got the camera at the bottom. And knowing the distances then between the laser, the camera, and the Sentinel isocenter, the system then uses an optical triangulation technique to generate a surface of the patient when they're being scanned. And once the surface is generated, the user can then specify a particular region on the surface. And within that region, the Sentinel scanner will then measure the vertical displacement, so how the patient moves up and down at that particular point. And that data can then be used to generate a breathing signal. And that can either be sent to the CT scanner to help generate a 4D CT scan, or it can be used to help facilitate a, a consistent breath hold for the CT scan. The second part of the Sentinel system is then a laser, which is positioned behind the CT scanner. And that laser is designed to kind of fix on and to hone in on a sensor, which is fixed to the back of the CT couch. So then as the CT couch drives through the bore, the laser system is able to work with the sensor in order to measure the couch sag at different points of table positions. So the reason this is useful is that when the patient, for example, is holding their breath through a breath hold, if the signal moves up or down for whatever reason during the scan, we want to be sure that that is actually the patient maybe breathing in a bit more, breathing out a bit more, and not to do with the sag of the couch. So having this additional laser system in place is really useful to improve the accuracy of the scanning process. So when it comes to the CT, the Sentinel system, there's a couple of different applications that we use it for in Swansea. We use it for 4D CT acquisition. For some patients that require it, we also use the metronome feature. We also use it to um, provide visual coaching for breath hold scanning, and we also use it to capture surfaces of patients, which can then be used to help set up the patient for treatment. And I'm going to touch upon these different points over the next few slides. So I've mentioned deep inspiration breath hold, or DIBH, a couple of times. For those of you who aren't familiar, um, for breast patients, it's a particularly useful practice to essentially increase the distance between the region that you're looking to treat, which is the breast, and one of the nearby organs at risk, which is the heart. So by taking a breath and inflating the lungs, you can increase that distance and essentially reduce the dose to the heart and the associated risks of heart disease after the patients had their treatment. So I'm going to go through now the workflow for how we scan our patients in deep inspiration breath hold. So to start with, we get the patient on the bed and we use our standard immobilization and we make sure the patient feels comfortable. At this point, we then give the patient the goggles or the glasses and we'll make sure that they're comfortable on the patient and around the nose and around the ears. And at this point, we won't turn on the display for the goggles, but we'll just make sure that they fit well. There is also the option of using a tablet or a light panel, but in Swansea, we tend to use the goggles for the CT appointment. So once the patient's set up on the bed, the first step is to optimize the surface acquisition settings in order to get a nice complete surface of the patient. In the same way that Sebastian talked about with the catalyst, we also have to repeat that with the Sentinel. So there's a low, medium and high default setting and you can see here for a volunteer on the bed what the difference is between using the low medium and high values you essentially get a more complete surface you also like on the catalyst you have to pick a yellow box so that the sentinel system knows where to gather the data from 
the actual values which are being used for these low, medium and high values are essentially the integration time and the threshold. So if you want to, you can actually edit these values manually. So if you want to get a more complete surface, you can increase the integration time or you can reduce the threshold. But in Swansea, we tend to just use the high default setting and that gives us a good surface for most of our patients. So once we have the surface, we then have to choose a gating spot. And the gating spot on the software can be moved around the surface to a suitable location. So once um, you've picked a gating spot, essentially what the system is doing is it's measuring the average vertical displacement across that red circle region, which is a couple of centimetres wide. And it's recommended to try and find a flat surface if possible, just to reduce the variation in vertical displacements across that particular region. So usually somewhere in the sternum or about that region is suitable for a breast patient. We then have to get to the actual important part, which is the deep inspiration breath hold. So initially what we do is without the visual coaching provided to the patient, we ask the patient to take a breath hold or two or three, and we essentially see what the patient's able to manage. Some patients struggle with breath holds, many patients can manage it. So at this point, we can actually see how deep of a breath the patient is able to achieve. And at that point then, we'll then go into the software and you'll notice on the screen here that there's two green lines and this is what we call the gating window. There's a lower and a higher value. So the user can then specify that gating window to cover what the patient is able to achieve when they're holding their breath. We typically use three millimeters for our gating window. And for most patients, that gating window is approximately a centimeter above the baseline breathing level, which is that blue line at the bottom. So once the patient has taken a couple of breaths and we've picked a reasonable gating window, we then enable the visual coaching. And this is essentially what the patient will see through the glasses. They'll see a blue line at the bottom, which stays stationary. They'll then see an orange bar, which will move up and down based on the amplitude of the patient's breathing. And then they'll see a green box, which is the target that they need to achieve for their breath hold. It is possible to refresh the baseline. So after the patient takes their breath hold, sometimes they don't always go straight back to that baseline level straight away. So it is possible to refresh that baseline level if needed, but on treatment, this isn't something that we would um, recommend doing. So it is sometimes better to try and coach the patient back to that baseline if needed. So once the patient's comfortable with the, the breath hold process and what they're looking at on the goggles, we then coach the patient into the gating window from outside the room in the control area and we'll acquire the scan as normal. After the scan's been acquired, there is the option, if the breathing signal were to move outside of the gating window, to adjust that gating window just to cover where the patient was actually able to achieve during the scan. And that way then, when the patient is on treatment, the treatment radiographers have a, an accurate understanding of what was achieved during the CT process. The system will also ask you if you want to apply a laser offset at the end of the scan. This can be useful for certain applications if, for example, after, say, the Sentinel free breathing surface was captured, the table had to be moved. Or, for example, when we first started using the Sentinel system, we actually referenced our patients locally to the anterior tattoo. So in this particular scenario, we had to tell the system what the difference was between the anterior tattoo and the Sentinel isocenter, which is essentially the intersect of the anterior and the lateral tattoo. But since then, we reference our patients to the intersect of the anterior and lateral tattoos, so we don't have to worry about this. So moving on to the 4D CT workflow, it's actually very similar to the deep inspiration breath hold workflow. Essentially, you start off by capturing a surface of the patient. You then choose your gating spot. The breathing trace is then measured by the system, and this can be sent to the CT scanner. You'll see a light appearing on your Sentinel software. So if you get a green light, that's a confirmation that that data has been successfully sent to the CT scanner and will continue to be sent throughout the scan duration. And that data can then be used to acquire a 4D CT scan. You do often find with 4D CT scans that you might get artifacts, uh, blurring, duplication, overlapping, uh, various artifacts. And some of these originate from when the patient isn't breathing consistently. Sometimes when the table starts moving or perhaps if they're having contrast, 
it can cause the breathing to be a little bit more erratic than you would like in order to get a good 4D CT scan. So for these patients, having a metronome to give the patient a target to breathe against can be particularly useful. So there is that function within the Sentinel system if you want to use it. So the breathing trace is essentially monitored by the software. And after about five, 10 seconds, you'll notice that a green curve shows up on the screen and tries to match the red kind of patient breathing curve as closely as it can. Once the characteristics are as close as possible, so essentially the system will try and change the amplitude and the frequency and the wavelength in order to try and get the best match possible. Once it's kind of reaching a reasonable level of agreement, you can lock those characteristics and then the audio coaching will begin if enabled by the user. So if, for example, this sinusoidal waveform is saying that the patient is breathing at 15 breaths per minute, that would be four seconds per breath. So every two seconds, the system will tell the patient to breathe in and then breathe out. Unfortunately, the system is just a sinusoidal wave and it does always give equal time intervals between inhale and exhale. And we tend to find that most patients want to spend more time naturally in exhale than inhale. So there is the option within the Sentinel software to type in your own values for inhale and exhale. So we've come up with a local table to provide our radiographers a starting point for different breaths per minute in order to work out what the time should be for different splits between inhale and exhale. So just to touch upon the tattooless Sentinel workflow, we actually still scan our patients with the Beakley metal markers, which you can see on the CT scan here. And the intersection of these Beakley markers tell us where the CT and the Sentinel isocenter actually is. Within our treatment planning system, we then calculate the shifts from that CT isocenter to the plan isocenter. And these values are then sent across to the, the catalyst and used to help set up the patient on treatment. So moving on to the catalyst now, and Sebastian's already talked about how the catalyst system works, so I won't dwell too much on that for this presentation today. Like Sebastian said, we also use the three catalyst HD plus system, or the HD system in Swansea. So we have three cameras all positioned around the isocenter, and all of that data is combined in order to generate a complete surface, which is used to set up and monitor patients. If the patient then moves outside of a predefined tolerance, the beam is actually held. So there's three tolerances on the system. There's the tolerance that we've just talked about now for the breath hold. So we have the three millimeter gating window in Swansea. So if the patient moves outside of that gating window, the beam is held automatically. There's also the surface tolerance. So this is the tolerance which applies to comparing all of the live and all of the reference surface. And if any part of those two surfaces falls outside of the tolerance, the beam is held. And then you also have the isocenter tolerance. And this is what's shown in the top right hand corner. And essentially this vector is a combination of the left, the, the longitudinal, the lateral, the vertical um, offsets and the different rotational elements as well and it projects all of those offsets into one vector value. And these measurements are heavily weighted towards the isocenter and the surface around that particular region. So this has its own tolerance as well. And if this falls outside of its tolerance, the beam is also held. And Sebastian's already touched upon the different colors which are projected onto the patient. It's not just on the software, it's also on the patient as well. So this is particularly useful for helping to set up the patient. So in Swansea, we started off using the catalyst system just for breasts and for deep inspiration breath hold patients, but we've since expanded to a range of different sites which are covered on this screen. In terms of our workflow, we start off with the catalyst system by aligning the room lasers to the tattoos if they have them, or if they don't have tattoos, just to the surface of the approximate treatment region. On the first fraction, we'll optimize the camera settings just to make sure that we're getting a good kind of complete surface of the patient, especially around the area being treated. We'll then transition across to C position and in C position, the system will tell us how much of an offset there is between where the patient is and where they need to be. And these offsets can be sent through Mosaic to the table couch and we can use the automatic setup function to automatically move the table to where it needs to go to. 
So once the radiographers are happy with the patient setup, we'll then transition across to C-Motion. And during this transition process, a new fraction-specific reference is captured. At this point, we'll typically acquire an image, whether it's a cone beam CT or an MV portal image. And if the imaging and the shifts shown by that image suggest that we need to move the table, we'll then capture a new reference after those shifts have been applied. And then during the treatment, we'll then monitor the isocenter drift, the patient surface alignment and the breathing signal if it is a breath old patient, just to make sure that everything stays in tolerance. So when we're treating patients in deep inspiration breath holds, there are some subtle differences to the workflow on the LINAC, which I'll touch upon now. So to start with, when we're actually setting up the patient, in Swansea, we actually only acquire a deep inspiration breath hold CT scan. So we actually use a free breathing surface, which is captured, which is then used to set up our patient in C position. So once the patient is set up and the radiographers are happy with the agreement, we'll then enter C-Motion. And in C-Motion for a breath hold patient, the system starts by prompting the user to ask the patient to take a breath hold. And at that point, the system retains all of the information that was saved during the Sentinel session. So where the baseline was, what the distance was between the baseline and the gating window. So it should all be very familiar to the patient when they're asked to take their breath. And when the breathing signal reaches the green window, a new surface is then captured at that point, and that will then be the new fraction specific reference. There's a couple of different reference surfaces which I've touched upon during the presentation. So for breath hold patients, we tend to use the, the surface which is captured by the sentinel, and that's in free breathing. Obviously, it's just coming down from one vantage point just above the CT scanner. So there are some shadow artifacts sometimes, but it is good enough to be able to capture important landmarks on the patient and to help set up the patient. For non-deep inspiration breath hold patients, we often just use the external, which is outlined on the CT scan within the treatment planning system. And you can see here, compared to the Sentinel, it is a bit more complete um, and it includes a bit more detail. And more often than not, we will have to capture new reference surfaces during treatment. So you can see here what that looks like next to the other two surfaces. So I have an example here of a patient actually being treated. You can see initially there's a lot of yellow on the patient's surface, just because this is a breath hold patient. And at this moment in time, they're just breathing away normally. So when I start the video, you'll be able to see that as soon as the patient breathes in, the orange bar moves up to the green window. You'll notice that all of the isocenter metrics are within one or two millimeters or one degree. And you'll notice that there's a nice blend of green and blue on the patient's surface. And if you notice then, as soon as the breathing signal drops out of the gating window, you'll see this yellow appearing on the screen. And you'll see this exclamation mark, which will essentially stop any further radiation from being delivered. So after a patient has been treated, you can go into the CRAD database and it will provide some information about that particular session. For this example, for a breath hold patient, you'll notice that the gray here represents when radiation is being delivered and the red is the isocenter metric being out of tolerance when the patient's in free breathing. So this is just the isocenter vector, but if you want to, you can extract the data and send it to Excel, for example, and you can break down the shifts into each of the specific directions. So you can look and see, for example, how the longitudinal value managed throughout the treatment if needed. And finally, managing bolus, it is a complicated workflow when it comes to SGRT. Um, we actually set up our breast patients in C position without the bolus typically. And once we're happy with the alignment, we'll then add the bolus before transitioning to C motion. Conventional superflab bolus, like the image shown at the top in yellow here, isn't picked up particularly well by the catalyst system or by any SGRT system as shown by the bottom image here. So you do need to consider alternative options just to make sure that you can actually monitor the region that you're treating during the delivery. So finally, I'd just like to say a special thank you to the team in Swansea who've helped us to get to the stage where we are. It's really a team effort bringing this type of technology in. And thank you all for listening. Thank you, Sebastian and Adam. What thoughtful and fascinating presentations. 
Our audience, our audience has been quite engaged and we have received a few questions for you. Just a reminder that if you have a question, there is still time to enter it in the chat. If you guys both are ready, let's jump right in. Sebastian, you shared that there is an interface for the TrueBeam Linux, but do you know if there will be an interface for ring-shaped countries as well? Um, so hello to everyone <laughs> again. Um, now, now I'm in the picture. So yes, uh, there there is a possibility for for Catalyst on the ring-shaped countries, but there is no interface yet. But it will be in the future, I hope, because Varian and Cred will 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 go it through. I wish you will work on that. Yeah. You use a three millimeter gating window, and uh, there is, are questions about how you ended up with that value and how you would advise to determine the ideal value in general. Alex, um, yeah, essentially, when we had our training from Beatrice, who works for CRAD, and she's the application specialist. Um, she comes from a centre in Sweden where they've been using CRAD for for several years, and they uh, essentially kind of decided upon the three millimeter gating window. Like with anything in radiotherapy, the smaller the gating window, the the smaller your tolerance, the more precision you can have, and it gives you the the better flexibility to give a consistent breath hold. So. From our experience, as long as you choose your gating window, the level of the gating window above your baseline, um, and that's sensible for the particular patient, um, the three millimeter window tends to be achievable by the majority of the patients. And we have had scenarios where patients, you tell them that if they can hold their breath for long um, and really deeply, it can reduce the heart dose. So they go above and beyond and try and do a really deep breath hold. And that's not then achievable for um, multiple breath holds during treatment. So you do need to spend a bit of time coaching the patient and making sure that a reasonable breath hold is achieved. But from our experience in Swansea, a three millimeter gating window is reasonable and achievable for the majority of patients. And the nice thing about the CRAD software is you can customize the window length. So there are other centers I'm aware of that treat with a slightly larger gating window and it's completely customizable by the user. So you can set that based on your local practice. Thank you, Adam. Sebastian, you presented uh, surfaces that seem patched with certain anatomy occluded. Does that prevent you from using the system in clinical routine? And uh, an another question that ties in with that, how would you proceed with patients that are obese and that perhaps have, have lots of their anatomy, most notably the gating point, blocked um, by, the, by, the, by the scanner? So um, uh, for the patched ones, uh, that that is not most of the time a problem. It's a problem when it's uh, I don't know when we are radiating a, a right breast patient, and there will be like a hole on the on the right breast or something. What we want to see, then it would be a problem. But most of the times you can do it with the settings. Yeah, when you when you adjust the settings right, then you then you can. Uh, patch up this these holes that you have and and you see everything with obese patients i think um because we have the free camera system then it's not that much of a problem we use the body shape from the ct and when we have the free camera system on the on the linux then it's not that big problem i think it could be a problem with one camera from the front but with free cameras there there is no like we can do all patients we had like really obese patients and everything worked really well and it's a it's a really good help because like you know when when there is obese patients they have a lot of skin and most of the times you are shifting the skin when you move the patient and not the patient so for that reason it's a, a really good help with the with the sgrt Thank you, Sebastian. Adam, you'd like to add something to that, perhaps? Yeah, I think like Sebastian said, as long as you've, well, even if you've only got the one camera system, um, the central camera does a very good job at um, kind of measuring um, kind of a good portion of the patient surface. And when it comes to gating, for example, as long as your gating point is central within the patient um, and you're getting a nice complete surface in that particular region, uh, we, we haven't really had any problems from our perspective setting up patients, even if they are on a larger side. 
Well, thank you, Sebastian and Adam, for the discussion and for sharing your presentation today. We're up on our time, and I want to thank everyone for your attention. If we didn't get to your question, we will reach out to you after the broadcast. As a reminder, we will be sharing the link to the recording with all attendees later this week. With that, I want to thank again Adam and Sebastian, and I will close the webinar for today. Thank you, and enjoy your week. Thank you. Thank you.